came into the masjid and he saw somebody put the mushaf on the floor. So he got a pair of shoes and he put it on his head. <laughs> Alhamdulillah wa salat wa salam ala rasulillah amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome back to Beyond the Member podcast. I am your host, Muhammad Basaid. And today, alhamdulillah, I have a very, very special guest with me. And I know I always say this, you know, but this guest who's with me, Allahumma Barik, is very dear to my heart. Uh, I'm joined this evening with none other than Ustad Jamal Abdel Nasser. Assalamu alaikum, Ustad. Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you keeping, Ustad? Alhamdulillah, very okay. well. Allahumma I need to give you, you know, like a great introduction because obviously it's the first time on the podcast. <laughs> Barakallah, big jazakallah khairan. Thank you for inviting me and having me. And it's a pleasure to be with you. And to be with the masjid and to be participating in the Beyond the Member podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you were saying earlier, like, obviously, we don't really say Beyond the Member podcast in yeah, the link, yeah. but Alhamdulillah, it is Beyond the Member podcast. You we'll know, bring it to life today, inshallah. We'll mention it a few times. We'll refer to it, inshallah. <laughs> Jazakallah khair. Barakallah peace. Barakallah. Ustaz, we've had um, Allah Mubarak a really busy year in 2022. You know, and we've been uh, talking throughout the year. Absolutely. I think we were saying that I probably met you. Only once yeah. uh, last year, and now I'm meeting you again once again. Shall yeah. I meet you more? Shall but we do keep in touch on the phone. Alhamdulillah, lots, yes. Alhamdulillah. And uh, you've been involved in giving talks at uh, universities. Yep. How have you mm. found that? Alhamdulillah, I really enjoy visiting uh, the universities. Mm. I've been doing it for years, subhanAllah. MashaAllah. Over 10 years. Yeah. Uh, I know I look young. <laughs> and do. I don't look just look young, I am young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I started younger than this. So Alhamdulillah, visiting the Shabab and the Shabbat, the young brothers and sisters, is something that I personally enjoy. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I try my best to give a lot of time to it. Alhamdulillah. Barakallah <laughs> feek. Now, Ustad, um, I, I, when, we, when I first wanted to do the podcast with you, yeah. um, I was mentioning to you that um, I wanted to, to talk about your journey, about your relationship with the Quran. And then I know that you uh, memorized, fully memorized the Quran at the age of 13. Amen. Allahumma barik. Amen. And then the more I was looking at the podcasts that you were doing, Amen. the more it really, it, I was really drawn to speaking more about the Quran itself. Uh, and obviously that I was inspired by you uh, to do that. So today what I want to discuss with you is, of course, uh, the Quran, you know, Kalamullah. So I've got a few questions for you, inshallah. I know I say a few, but there's probably going to be more <laughs> than that. But um, one of the first questions I want to ask you, Stad, because this is really important at the time, you know, where people who, especially those on university, you know, they're being questioned about their faith, you know, about uh, the Quran and it's it being a miracle, how it's a miracle and stuff like that. So the first question I do want to ask you is, as Muslims, how do we, kn how do we know, but how do we explain that the Quran, it is indeed a miracle? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'du. Uh, the Quran is miraculous in all of its nature, whether we look at the Quran from the perspective of its wordings, its meanings, its revelation upon the final prophet of Islam, or the final prophet of mankind, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was living in Arabia at a time where there was not much knowledge present. Uh, like Allah Jalla wa mentions, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent him out to a group of people who couldn't read and write from the beginning. So the Quran is miraculous in all of its nature. So if we give some examples, uh, the memorization of the Quran, for example, mm -hmm. or the hifth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the preservation of Allah uh, in terms of its wordings. Allah Jalla wa says in the Quran, inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun. It is us, Rabbul Alameen, who have sent down the dhikr, the remembrance, and it is us who will preserve it. Now, we are the only group of people on the face of the earth who have Millions of people have memorized the Quran. Allahu Akbar. Millions. They say there's about 1.8 billion Muslims on the planet. So we have millions. Uh, it would be very stingy and wrong of us to say there are 1.8 billion Muslims and we don't even have 1 million Muslims <laughs> who have memorized the Quran. We have more than that. Walillahi alhamd. Now, our miracle is that we have millions who have memorized our book. Mm. Whereas when you look at comparative religions or when you look at other people and faiths that they belong to or other ways of life you find that the miracle becomes we found one person that memorized our book mm. finding someone wujud for it to turn up becomes the miracle whereas we say it's a standard 
<laughs> we say it's a standard. And on top of that, we say it's more of a standard because the majority of those millions who memorize our book, they're non Arabs, like myself, for example. Subhanallah. I'm not an Arab, I'm an African man, as you can see. <laughs> but I memorize the book of Allah. In fact, in London, the area that I live, it's very common to find every household to have at least one half of Allah. Where I live in London, Allah. it's normal standard. And it, it will be rare to find a house that doesn't have one half of that at least. That's one angle now. Mm. And how can a person memorize a book that's 600 pages, not in his language? It's or a person coming to Islam and then memorizing the book, or then memorizing the book, and then on top of that, not knowing the meanings of the words. So you ask him, Kayfa haluka, how are you? And he says, what does that mean? But if you say, read the surah, he'll read the surah. SubhanAllah. That's just one angle. Mm. Another angle you find the Quran's meanings, they are timeless. So whichever era you belong to, the Quran was reveal, revealed primarily to the Prophet and those with him 1400 years ago. But it wasn't revealed upon them for hasb. It wasn't only revealed upon them. It was revealed to all of the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent the Prophet out to. The Prophets before our Prophet وسلم, were only sent to their people. The Prophet وسلم, he said about himself, as for myself, I have been sent out to all of mankind. So the book that he was given as well, likewise, was sent to all of the people. Meaning any problem you have, any situation you have, any matter that you find yourself in, if you open the Quran to any page, you could extrapolate a benefit from that that will help you move on in your life and give you an admonition and lift you up. It's about being able to do so. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking for the truth, you will always find the truth in the Quran to uplift your soul, and to awaken your heart. Allah. So that's from the meanings as well. So we spoke about the memorization, we spoke about the meanings. And there are many other ways, but I don't want to just continue. No, on no, Jazakal Khair. One thing that I would like you to do in including <coughs> what you're saying about the miracle is indeed the miracle of the Quran being recited itself and the effect that it can have on people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because I was I was thinking about this uh, yesterday and it's the power of speech, mm -hmm. right, in terms of me talking to you and whatever I say to you will affect you in some sort of way Man. whether the cho the way I'm choosing my words and also mm. how I'm saying what I'm saying to you so. it has a, an effect on you psychologically even maybe physically and you find that with many people you know, engaged in relationship you know between a husband and wife between parent and children however you talk it has a really big effect on on that on that person now the Quran, when it was when it's recited, especially to the Arabs, who would become Muslim as soon as they 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 would just take on the religion after hearing the Quran. So, give me more about when the Quran is recited. No. the Quran. One of the descriptions that Allah Jalla Ala gave it in Surah Yunus Alayhi Salam is that it is a mawidah. Mm -hmm. Mawidah. When you look at the meaning of this term, it means you can say in English a heart hitting reminder or a hard-hitting reminder. So it hits hard and it hits the heart, it penetrates. And the Qur'an and the heart have a very close relationship. Mm -hmm. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ قَدَ جَاءَتْكُمْ مَوْعِظَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ O oh, mankind. And that links to what we said before, not all Muslims, mm -hmm. everybody. No, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا All those who have believed, O oh, mankind. قَدَ جَاءَتْكُمْ مَوْعِظَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ Indeed, a mawida has come from your Lord. One that is going to hit your heart and one that the heart is going to appreciate. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were to give an example of this from the people of the past, like you mentioned, we have an uh, illustrious scholar, a prolific scholar from the past by the name of Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad. Mm -hmm. It was said about him in his manaqib or in his seerah or in his biography that he was a highway robber. And he used to terrorize the people and cast fear into their hearts. And one night he was going to go and commit something a crime and he heard somebody reciting the Quran he heard somebody reciting a verse from Surah Al-Hadid the statement of Allah Alam ya'ni lilladhina amanu an takhshaa qulubuhum li dhikri Allah wa ma nazala min al-haqq wa la yakunu kalladhina utu al-kitaba min qabl fa tala alayhim al-amadu fa qasat qulubuhum hasn't the time not come for those who have believed to surrender their hearts to the remembrance of Allah and so he said straight away when he heard this al-ana now it has come. Meaning to me, he took it to be a personal message. Mm -hmm. And this ayah wasn't revealed in respect to Fudayl. How could it have been when Fudayl came after? Fudayl was not from the Sahaba. Mm. So because it wasn't revealed in respect to him, he did something known as tanzil. He applied it on himself. 
And that's the meaning of the Quran is revelation. That's what Allah Jalla wa Ala wants. Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyadabbaru ayati. Wa fi qiraatin liyadabbaru ayati. So this ayat, these ayat, we take it and we apply them on ourselves. That's what he did. So he said, Al-Ana, time has come. And he said, I'm not going to continue doing this. And he left that path and he began the path of the Quran and the path of light. Now, the same evening or later on, there were two men who wanted to go on a journey. And so they said that, should we take, they had a discussion. One of them said, should we take the journey? And he was pushing to take the journey. And the other one, he said, no, we shouldn't take the journey because Al-Fudayl is here. He's a highway rover. And uh, this reached Al-Fudayl. And this really messed him up inside. And he said, subhanAllah, people are scared of me like this. Mm-hmm. But what was the point? Where was his turning point? It was the Quran itself. So if you take the Quran as an admonition, a book that is speaking to you, mm-hmm. then it will have the highest power, inshaAllah ta'ala, on the heart. JazakAllah khair, Allah barik feek. Now, you just mentioned uh, from Surah Yunus um, examples uh, of what the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the Quran, it, it describes it as a mawaida. Mm-hmm. Give us um, different examples as well of names, descriptions of the Quran uh, that Allah uses. Yeah. Another name that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Quran as is Al Furqan. Mm-hmm. And there's a surah in the Quran called Al Furqan. And Al Furqan is a Meccan surah, it was revealed before the Hijrah. Al Furqan, it means that which is a distinction between truth and falsehood. Yeah. And that's one of the main objectives of the Quran. That through the Quran and a person holding onto it firmly, he begins to understand from his depth or from his core that which is right from that which is wrong. Tabarak al ladhi nazzal al furqana ala abdihi liyakuna lil alameen anadira. Tabarak al ladhi nazzal al furqana ala abdihi. And look at how Allah Jalla wa'ala refers to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ala abdihi. Mm-hmm. I want to take a little benefit here that whenever he speaks to him about revelation or he speaks to him about the unique matters that he gave him as a prophet, he refers to him as an abd. Mm-hmm. Like another place in the Quran, the surah we read today on Friday, Alhamdulillah al ladhi anzal ala abdihi al kitab. His servant, his worshipper, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He gave him the furqan, this distinction or the distinguisher between truth and falsehood, liyakuna, so he may become lil'alameena to all of mankind, nadiran, one that warns. Mm. Because this is going to be his toolkit. This is going to teach him, alayhi salatu wa salam, and then help him to teach everybody else, alayhi salatu wa salam, that which is right from that which is wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, بَلْ هُوَ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ فِي صُدُورِ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ وَمَا يَجْحَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَّا الظَّالِمُونَ the Quran is clear cut and distinct verses and it has been placed into the hearts and the chests of those who have knowledge in order for them to pass it on to the other people and for them to be a means for them to understand that which is right from that which is wrong. So another name is Al-Furqan. Barakallah. Yeah. Now, as we know, um, as Muslims, we take our knowledge from two sources, the Quran and the Sunnah. Mm. And there is a hadith that I want um, you to speak about and it is... Uh, the hadith of um, when Aisha was asked about how was the um, character, how was the the akhlaq of the, of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, since you have uh, mentioned him. What is it that she described okay. his, she, cause she sh- could have said anything, you know, about his mm-hmm. akhlaq, but mm-hmm. she summed it up, you know, it's almost like she was, she she got concise speech from the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, so and so she, she ex- described him as something. And uh, what did she describe him as? And mm-hmm. I want to know also, um, what does that hadith mean? No, no, no. Uh, Aisha, our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was asked about the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she said, Kana Quran. His character was that of the Quran. Uh, something to clarify here before mm. we meet, speak about the meanings yeah, yeah. is that we do not say that he was a Quran that was walking. Uh, some say this, but the ulama have mentioned that it's better to refrain from saying that uh, because it may give a connotation for the Quran mm. uh, that is negative. Uh, now, this means that the Prophet ﷺ, he had the greatest of character. Nobody's perfect. Mm. However, closer to perfection is the one who has the perfect words in his life. And the epitome of perfection a person will reach when they are with this book. She could have said, he is very kind, he is very warm, he's very nice, he's very polite, very respectful, honorable, brave, وحكذا. and he was all of those things, alayhi salatu wa and more. But he, she gave, like you said, one word that comprises all of those things, kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an, which shows that this is from the greatest objectives also of the Qur'an al-Kareem, mm-hmm. that a person, 
he refines his character and he gives him definition in terms of how he is, how she is, how they behave, how they act, what they say, how they behave with people. Now the Quran goes through these things, by the way. The Quran mm. mentions that if you are harmed by the people, if you are hurt, فَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ Turn away from the people who are ignorant. In fact, Allah Jalla wa'ala speaks to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam specifically. And he says, وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمُ أَنَّكَ يَضِيقُ صَدْرُكَ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ We know, O oh Muhammad, that that which they are saying about you, it really brings your heart tight-chestedness or your chest tight-chestedness. Tight mm. So he said, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ Glorify your Lord in praise and remain with those who are prostrating and continue worshipping Allah until you pass away. Yani, if the Quran really is in your life like that, it will teach you good character when you deal with the people that are wronging you. If in order for you to be a person who is upon good character, you have to overlook a lot of things. Mm. إلا من أساء إليك. Be good to the ones that are bad to you. Give to the ones that prevent you. Give salam to the ones who don't give it to you. All of these things are taught to us in the Sunnah. But she said that he implemented the Quran. And now we connect that which we said about the Quran and the Sunnah. He was given the Quran in order for him to show us the application of the Quran. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ We have revealed upon you the Quran in order for you to show the people in your application and your daily life. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So us as uh, Muslims now, how do we make practical steps? How do we make make sure that our character, it is indeed the Quran? There's a shortcut. No, a very quick way. Akhlis ila kitabillah. Be truthful and sincere to the book of Allah Azza wa Jal and the Quran will change you. You'll see yourself changing. Mm. You don't have to do anything manually. Automatically it will happen. SubhanAllah. But it will happen automatically if manually you are sincere. Yeah. Yani, you can't be automatically sincere, right? Exactly. <laughs> You're pretty much insensitive. Yeah, automatically. <laughs> yani, be manually sincere. Jahid nafsaka. Go against your soul. Wage war against your soul until you reach where you need to reach with sincerity. Nobody can get to the end of sincerity, but try your hardest. Yeah. And when you do that, automatically the Quran that has entered within you will change you, bi'ithnillah, inwardly and outwardly. Mm. That's the easiest way. Yeah. You do not have to do it one by one, one by one, no. Because mm. the person may say, why do I need to do it one by one and then go to the Quran? I might as well do it this way. Nah. But no, the Quran will change you. The Quran has to enter though. Mm. If it enters, bi'ithnillah ta'ala, it will change you. And that's what happened to the Prophet So That's what happened to the Sahaba. <laughs> Umar radiallahu anhu, an example. Umar radiallahu anhu, out of the ten who were promised paradise, he was the last one to embrace Islam. But he's ranked second best after Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Nah. But he was the last. In fact, Umar radiallahu anhu, he used to uh, patronize the others who came to Islam before him and he used to tie them up and tell them to leave Islam. In fact, Umar radiallahu anhu, we know that he wanted to even take the life of the Prophet yes, yes. or he made an intention to do so, although that didn't happen because Allah wanted for him guidance and hidayah. When he came to Islam, he ranked second best. He became the same Umar later that they would see when he would read the Quran, his cheeks would become very damp due to the effect that the Quran had upon him. Now, Umar radiallahu anhu, he was manually, we can say, hmm. oh, a lack of a better way of explaining it. He became sincere or he was sincere and then automatically the Quran changed him from that man to that man. SubhanAllah. That's how it works. SubhanAllah. Now, for, 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 a, for a student um, of the Quran, um, we want to begin our journey with the Quran. Mm. Well, how do, what do we prioritize in between uh, recitation, memorization, afwan, and uh, tafsir? Yeah. As students of the Quran, I'm assuming you mean, you're meaning adults like us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Look, you could be kids as well, subhanAllah. Okay, we'll you come know, to the kids. We could, we could do, you know, make it a two-part answer. Two-part answer, okay. For the, for the youngsters okay. and for the like, people who are more mature. Jameen, Jameen. So the adults, we'll begin with the adults first. The adults, when they are learning the Quran, they must learn the Quran in terms of its wordings and its meanings together. Mm. And the reason is because they are in need of the meanings and they are in need of the wordings. Mm. What does that mean? That means you as an adult now, there are obligations upon you that Islam has set. You are memorizing the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of the obligations that Allah jalla wa ala has set are either in the Quran or the Sunnah. And you do not know these obligations. Maybe you have memorized them and you are reading them, but you do not know them. So this is going to be a hujja against you. Mm. It has to be a hujja for you. And in order for it to be a hujja for you, you must read, you must memorize, and then you must understand. The children is slightly different. The children, they may begin with memorization like they do in, in the West when they are going to madrasa and the tafsir and the meaning is delayed. And that is because nothing's obligated upon them yet. Mm. So they can learn later. There is time. Mm. 
so they can memorize in the beginning and use their minds. Their minds are now at a time or a stage where they can memorize and they can take it slowly. Mm. But we don't have that luxury. Yeah. Now let's look at the opposite for adults. What if they just do tafsir? And some of them, they say, we are not going to memorize, we're going to delay this. The problem you are going to have, and I actually saw this firsthand, Mashallah. is you may become very grounded in tafsir, but you don't know the ayah you are doing tafsir of. I saw somebody who was delivering a tafsir class or lesson, and he asked children where the ayat were. But he's prepared the tafsir, you know the tafsir. But because he hasn't memorized, he doesn't know where it is. Oh, so the kids helped him, okay, it's here in the Quran, then he delivered the, the tafsir. Ajeev. Yeah. So, as in, if you have the tafsir but you don't have the words, what are you doing tafsir of? Mm. You don't even know the words. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he would pass on the Quran or deliver the Quran to those around him, the mushrikun or the polytheists, they would come with their arguments and he would listen. And once they are finished, he would say, Are you finished? Afaragta. Yes, I am finished. He would read the Quran upon them. The reading. The mm. reading is the asal. And Allah mentions in the Quran, and this is the final part, He mentions that which the Prophet ﷺ was sent out for as it relates to the Quran. He said, Reading upon them, purifying them, and he said also teaching them. Those three things. Yatru alayhim ayati wa yuzakihim wa yu'allimuhum al kitab wal hikmah. All three, and, and reading is the first one. Mm. So you cannot skip reading, and we cannot leave understanding. No. We need to do all of it together, inshallah. Jazakallah. <laughs> People always ask, they ask the students of knowledge, and they ask the mashayikh, they say, I'm going to Egypt, and I'm pressed for time. <laughs> they think, why go to Egypt to be pressed for time? But he said, I'm going to Egypt, I'm pressed for time. I tried to Quran or Arabic and you're saying to him that okay if you learn the Quran just look at it let's look at it together if you learn the Quran and you don't know Arabic you're shortchanging yourself if you learn Arabic what's the point Arabic is like any other language yeah. like Spanish like French like English you need Arabic for the Quran so there's no other way but to do it together yeah, yeah. subhanAllah no. so that, we're talking about um, taking a journey with the Quran now and you're, you're, you're studying it inshallah or you want to begin studying it what are the etiquettes one should have with the Quran? There are many etiquettes. Mm. All of these things are, are many. Uh, in terms of the Quran and the etiquettes a student should display with the Quran, one of them is how he handles the Quran. Mm. The Quran itself, the Mus'haf. And I'm going to try and mention some of the ones that are less common first. Okay. So a lot of people may not have expected to have heard that, for example, handling the Quran, what does that mean? Mm. The Qur'an, it requires respect in all of its conditions. We believe as Muslims, our aqeedah, that the Qur'an is the uncreated, preserved words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. The scholars go as far as to say that the binding, the cover, the ink, the pages, yes, you may say all of that's created. It's the content that's within that's not created, right? But out of great honor and respect and etiquette that we come with, we hold the Qur'an in high esteem. Yeah. So the Qur'an, for example, we do not put it on the floor. This is not even from a legislative perspective, a spiritual perspective, a perspective of a talib of ilm. It requires etiquette. It requires for you to handle it correctly. It requires for you to hold it in high regard. That means do not put it on the floor. What does that mean? The floor is a place where you do not allow for your face to be on, except if you're making sajda. Mm -hmm. if, the floor is, if the floor is clean and the floor has been mopped or it is sparkling clean, you do not put your face on the floor even if it's clean, and you will say it is because the face is not for the floor, mm. except for sajda, like we mentioned. Likewise, the Quran is not for the floor. I remember a sheikh, he gave a parable, and he said, if somebody makes wudu, and he's washed all of his limbs, and he comes, and he puts his feet on your shoulder, and he says, don't be uh, taken aback, he said that my feet is clean, I, I made wudu. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the sheikh said, he said, you, you get even more angry because he's clarifying it now, <laughs> he's justifying it. That's worse. <laughs> why, are you why are you justifying it? So the, so the person asked the sheikh, sheikh, what you're saying makes sense, but why is it so wrong if he's clean his foot, if it's actually a clean foot? So the sheikh, he said, there's something known as tahara ma'nawiyya wa tahara hissiyya. Najasa ma'nawiyya wa najasa hissiyya. A type of purity which is tangible and one that's not. Impurity which is tangible and one that's not. Over here, there's no tangible impurity because the foot is clean. But the foot is known, it has a connotation that it's a... You don't give salam or greetings to the people. Your feet. Yeah, yeah khalas, that's <laughs> it. Uh, it was mentioned about Muhammad ibn Amin al-Shanqiq, rahimahullah ta'ala, that he came into the masjid and he saw somebody put the mushaf on the floor. So he got a pair of shoes and he put it on his head. 
<laughs> and then I think he looked at him or, or such and he said, Sheikh, what's this? And he said, what's this as well? <laughs> <laughs> like that. Yeah, like that, literally. That's not meant to be there and this is not meant to be there. Subhanallah. And you pick that up first, I'll pick that up next. <laughs> like this. So the Mus'haf should always be held in high, high regard. Uh, some of the early generation, they used to hold the Quran and they used to kiss it and they used to say, Kitabu Rabbi, Kitabu Rabbi. <laughs> the book of my Lord, the book of my Lord. So this shows initially now a student who has so much etiquette with the Quran like that, just from its mushaf, you can but imagine how he's going to be with his study. This is not going to be a student who misses classes or makes the very lame excuse that I have no time to memorize or Ustad or Shaykh, he has a class, I cannot make it today. Or even his nafs tells her, his nafs that, I have a reason in my head I cannot do anything today because of X, Y, and Z. If he has so much respect for the Mus'haf, the, the book of the, the speech of Allah, that the kalam of Allah inside is going to be something which he has. So that's one example. Another example is the wordings of the Quran when we are reading it or memorizing it or going through its explanation or exegesis that we give it time. And we do not rush by the words of the Quran. Imagine now uh, I'm talking to you and I, I speak very fast. And I, no, 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 I'm speaking like this and I say, okay, I'm time to go. I have to go to back to London where I came from. Uh, forget about the podcast being ruined. The person will be disrespected. Yeah, it's, it's true. The host who has invited you and you are their guest and you speak to them like this is not something very nice and it doesn't leave a good impression. Now, imagine if we are dealing with Allah like that. And imagine if we do it Allah all of the time like that and we are reading the Quran like this. Now when we are reading the Quran, we are told in the Salah, the greatest act of worship, the greatest surah is being read in every single rak'ah. If you read it correctly, every single ayah, this will result in Allah responding to you. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Hamadani Abdi, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Athna Aliya Abdi, Maliki, until the end. So Allah, but if you're reading in an incorrect way, and there's no etiquette, and there's no respect for the Quran, that may not transpire. SubhanAllah. So it shows that you are the only one that's going to benefit when you show etiquette with the Quran al Kareem. There's two examples. No, Jazakal Khair. You know, because I know we um, we could ex- really expand on so it. Much, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, but Jazakal Khair, it's really, really um, uh, eye opening, you know, uh, and um, how we are with the Quran. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's really, really important, and which is why, you know, I'm really, really glad you came to, to discuss it. <laughs> Jazakal Khair. I'm glad to be here. Now, <coughs> How, how can we then, as Muslims, uh, make the Quran relatable to our daily lives, right? So our daily lives, everything that we do, we want it to revolve around the Quran. No. The Quran is already relatable from the get go. No doubt. Yeah. How do we understand that or appreciate that? I mean, if you're in search of guidance for your daily life or direction or if you are in search for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to grant you some type of answer to a uh, matter that you are in need of then if you are truly in search of it Allah will guide you to it inshallah ta'ala yeah. uh, there's many examples that we can go through it was mentioned about a da'iya in France uh, who was a Jew before a young boy uh, his name was Jadullah. Uh, he started off, it's a long story. Uh, you can find it on YouTube for those who are listening to this. Uh, but he, he was a Jew and uh, he embraced Islam. And the way he embraced Islam was a Muslim man, a Turkish Muslim man, showing him the Quran. And he said, Any problem you have, I will give you a relatable answer from the Quran in any two pages of your choice. You open it, I will show you. And it could be any matter. And he said, don't believe me, test me. As easy as that. And he began and said, testing him. Every single time, he brings it out. Somehow, he brings it out. And not somehow, because we know the Quran is like that. He brings it out, he brings it out, he brings it out. He became Muslim in the end. The guy who was a reason for this young Jewish, ex-Jewish boy to come to Islam, passed away. He continued the journey and the mission with the book that brought him into Al-Islam, out of darkness into light. And he called people to this Quran and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this Quran. And it was mentioned people in the thousands became Muslim in France. He then migrated to Africa. And then tens of thousands of people became Muslim all through the Quran and showing the people how it's relatable to their daily lives. Allahu what problem do you have? I'll show you right now. Here's the Quran. You pick the page. I'll show you. Your date is right here. Allah mentions it. Now, an example now, just to make it make sense for us, is a person, for example, is going through a matter with a group of people, conflict, mm-hmm. and they have fallen out with people. 
and you wish to make amends. Right now, people are advising you. People are telling you different things. And maybe the shaitan has got the better of you. Your emotions have got the better of you. And you're struggling to come to terms with what people are telling you. And you know you should. But because people are telling you this, and maybe you've really been hurt by the other party, you don't really take what they say. Mm. How can we bring that from the Quran? The Quran wasn't revealed upon you or I. But the Quran speaks about everything. Or like Allah says, Nothing has been left outside of this book. An example is, Allah says, وَلَا تنسوا الفضل بينكم. That's an example now. Don't forget the virtues between you two. Don't forget the good times. Don't forget the things before this. And you retrace your steps before this. This is one issue. How many good... Exactly. If a person has the ability to do this with people, they are an asset for the Muslims. That's one of the, but there's so many examples like that. Now, Jazakallah khair. Now, um, so regarding... Um, some things that you you when you when you practice right they become a part of your daily life uh these are habitual things how can we what habits can we can someone build uh with the quran mm -hmm. what are good habits that you can build build with the quran and i and i know i know i know um <coughs> my old uh quran teacher he was from uh, syria you know and um he used to tell us people in back in sham back in the day they would be doing their murajah, doing random things, Allah working Allah. in the shop, Allah. you know, baking bread, Allah. you know, and he used to tell us, you know, um, I've he also heard, not from him, but from others, from others, other teachers, that um, the Sahaba used to um, measure time by surahs. Subhanallah. Right, they measure by, by time. How, how, how far is it from here to here? They say, yeah. oh, this is from this juice to that juice yeah. to get from there to there. <laughs> right, so, subhanAllah, yani, so what, ha what are good habits someone can build with the Quran? No. From the good habits that we can build as general Muslims, it is that we never let a day go by except that we read the Quran. If we take the Quran as something which we have made so incumbent upon ourselves, I don't want to say obligatory, mm. but so important upon ourselves and we take it extremely seriously, inshallah ta'ala, we will see the barakah of it. How do we actually do this? An example is you make the Quran your bedside companion. Now, if you have a mushaf next to your bed, or if you do not have a desk there, then uh, on your bed itself, on the bed, you can leave a mushaf there. What happens is, even if your iman is very low, very low, if you've had a long day and you, all you want to do is sleep, seeing the mushaf there is going to do something to your heart. <laughs> yeah, it's there. You, you, you're going to either ignore it. You have a few options. <laughs> you either ignore it, mm. Or you either take it and you put it somewhere far away, which is, I think no Muslim would do that. Mm. Or the third one is that you're going to read it. And that's the one that's going to happen. No. Oh, nearly everybody. No. I remember I did this with a group of students in London. And they said that this worked wonders. Yeah. Just put it there and make it your bedside. It's always going to be there. Because sometimes you are really tired. Yeah. Now, we can't compare it to Isha or the prayers. Because if you come home and you're really tired and you haven't prayed Isha, it doesn't matter how tired you have to pray. <laughs> but you may say to yourself, justifying your head, the Quran is not the same thing. Mm. And it's not like the Salah. And it's true, it's not like the Salah. So what can I do to make it a daily habit like you asked? Put the Quran right there. Inshallah ta'ala. I think I like that. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm really, I'm already going through the, what I would do. And I can imagine coming home, the Quran is on my, on my bed, yeah. on the bedside. And I want to move it. Oh, but I need to take wudu. I might as well take wudu. I've got wudu now. I might as well read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's, I like that. Jazakallah khair. Definitely going to take that away. Barakallah khair. Inshallah, Ustad, it's been a brilliant, uh, brilliant having you. you know. Thank you so uh, much. I really appreciate you coming. Yeah, you know, I know you come from London. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we're, too, we're not too far away, <laughs> you know. Uh, but inshallah, <laughs> if you could uh, uh, give us uh, some final advice, inshallah, maybe even uh, regarding uh, the month of Quran coming, inshallah, inshallah, inshallah before we close our podcast. Inshallah ta'ala. Uh, we are currently uh, in the month of Sha'ban. Uh -huh. Well, depending when this uh, video comes out, inshallah ta'ala. Uh -huh. And this is the month prior to Ramadan. And a person who prepares, inshallah ta'ala, to achieve and to attain bi'idhnillah he will achieve and he will attain and will become successful uh, Ramadan is the month of Quran like you mentioned a lot of the Salaf al-Salih they used to refer to this month Sha'ban as the month of the Qurra so Ramadan is Shahrul Quran and this is Shahrul Qurra mm. so they will begin reading the Quran from now preparing themselves and preparing their hearts and conditioning themselves so when Ramadan comes they just sprint to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everything is smooth and if you haven't been reading so far 
then it's going to be very difficult for you to make all of these calculations in your head and say, I'm going to do one khatma this year, two khatma this year, three khatma this year. Do as many khatms as you like, inshallah ta'ala now, or if you can, uh, do as many khatms as you can right now. And then inshallah ta'ala in Ramadan, you will only build upon those habits, inshallah ta'ala. No. That's the first advice in terms of Ramadan. In terms of general advice uh, to myself, first and foremost, and to all of our brothers and sisters who are listening, is we should aim to be from one of three groups. As it relates to the Quran The first group is the best And they are the hafadah of the Quran The hamalah of the Quran Those who are carrying the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their hearts They have a copy of the mushaf in their chests And uh, these are the blessed people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to On the tongue of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa As his people Inna lillahi ta'ala Or inna lillahi ahlina min nas Qila man hum ya Rasulullah Qala ahlul Quran Hum ahlullahi wa khasatuhu the Quran was revealed upon the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. He read it with his blessed mouth. It was revealed to our Imams and our Imma, and it got passed down to us until it reached the people who Allah describes in this way. So these are the best of people. The second group, they are those who are the Darisin, those who are learning. So they are aspiring to be from the first, but they're not there yet. They're learning the Quran. And those learning the Quran, they remember the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, خيركم من تعلم القرآن وعلمه. The best amongst you all, the best amongst creation, mankind, and there's no other ilm or no other science. Imam Shafi'i he used to say, كُلُّ الْعُلُومِ مَشْغَلَةٌ سِوَى الْقُرْآنِ Everything is a distraction that you learn except for the Quran, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the Quran leads you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet وسلم, he said in the hadith in Bukhari on the authority of Uthman, the best of those Muslims are those who learn the Quran and teach it. They are second. So the second group are going to be the majority, but we are aiming to be from the first through the second. And the final group, inshallah ta'ala, are those who are not memorizing or not learning. May Allah make it easy for everybody. Uh, they are those who are going to do the things like we mentioned, bedside companion, listening to the Quran, reading the Quran, take from it something as well. Nobody should be without Quran. Yeah. The heart, the Prophet ﷺ said that doesn't have any Quran in it, zero. It is like the destroyed and ruined house. So these are the three groups. And if you are from the fourth, that means you have no share. So the first group, they are the hafadha, the carriers of the Qur'an. The second group are the learners of the Qur'an. And the last group are the general mass. They listen where they can, they read where they can. And they have some sort of relationship. May Allah grant us tawfiq. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallah khair. Allah, Allah bless you, Ustaz. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah, we'll conclude there. It's been an absolute amazing podcast. I would like to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost Ameen. for allowing us to be here Ameen. and to have the discussion about his perfect book, Alhamdulillah. And uh, I would like to ask the uh, people who are watching, the viewers, if you could like, share, subscribe and comment below. And inshallah, we will end it here. I've been Muhammad Basaid here with Ustad Jamal Abdel Nasser. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika shalu la ilaha 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 il